All right, um, turn in your books, in your Bibles, when you're going to need a Bible, as always. Um, we, uh, you know, my opinion is not worth much, but if you got your Bible, you can learn a lot. So break out your Bible. Always need Bibles here. And we're talking about everything that we needed to know we learned in kindergarten. I mean, the Bible. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to take yourself back to the first day of kindergarten. Now, I realize that some of you, and we won't point any fingers, but some of you are so old uh, that they didn't have kindergarten when you started school. But uh, you still remember a little bit of your first day of school, right? So raise your hand if you have any memory whatsoever, even if it's vague, because mine are pretty vague, your first day of school, kindergarten or first grade. So most of us have some sort of memory of our first day of school, okay? Um, if you think back to your first year of school in kindergarten or first grade, do you have any memories of your first year of school? Yeah? Okay. I remember vaguely my first day of school, my mom walking me in, because, you know, at kindergarten the parents always walk them into the class, you know. And I, re I vaguely remember going down the hallway and that smell. You know how schools have a unique smell? I don't know what they do to them, but schools always have a unique smell to them. And I remember that smell. And I remember getting in my classroom. And as I walked in, all the kids were in different stations playing with toys, basically. And the teacher came over to me and said, uh, Eric over here will show you where the... Uh, the counting bears are. Do y'all remember those little colored bears that you would count and put in different colors and stuff? And so this kid takes me and shows me where they're at. And I saw some kids playing with blocks. And I like to build block with blocks. So I said, hey, where did they get those blocks from? And he took me over and he showed me where the blocks were. And I saw some kids playing with Tinker Toys, if you remember Tinker Toys. And I said, well, hey, where did they get those Tinker Toys from? And he took me and he showed me where all the Tinker Toys were. I was like, this kid is amazing. He's a genius. He knows where, how long has he been here today, you know? It's 8 o'clock in the morning and he knows where everything is. And I found out later that Eric was in his second year in this classroom of kindergarten. And so, you know, he's, I'm no dummy. I've been here for four years. Listen to me, you know, that kind of Kind of stuff. So I remember my first day. I vaguely remember uh, some of the things about my first year. Um, I had forgotten this, but on the way over here, I told Allie what the message was about today, and she reminded me of Nolan because he had kindergarten this year. He was in the bathtub one day, and he said, I cannot wait for kindergarten. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, I can't wait to learn how to whistle. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I kind of broke my heart. I was like, oh, well, you know, buddy. I don't think they teach that anymore. And he said, why not? And I said, well, you know, it's not part of the curriculum anymore. And his face, you could just see, you know, it broke his heart that he wasn't going to learn how to whistle, you know. Uh, but he, he did learn how to whistle. He didn't learn it at school, but he did learn how to whistle. Uh, so I want to take you back to that first day of school. And let's look at Matthew chapter 7. My... Uh, kindergarten class, it's not like it is now, you know, now they, not completely, but now they separate the kids kind of like, um, a lot of the classrooms, like Nolan was in a combo class this year, and what they try to do is they, if you're in a combo class, they try to take the smartest five-year-olds and put them with the smartest first graders. Now, he was not one of the smartest kindergartners, but we were able to get him in that combo class because Noah and Allie were smart when they were in kindergarten, and Noah was in a combo class at some point, and it really benefited him. And so we thought, well, let's put Nolan in the combo class because it'll really benefit him. And Nolan was further behind than our other kids because uh, Noah and Allie went to preschool, and Nolan did not. And so Noah was very smart as soon as he got to kindergarten. A lot of it was because he had a good preschool teacher. And Allie was just smart on her own. Like uh, we were at the lake about this time of year when she was four years old or five years old. And she had not started kindergarten yet. And she picked up a book and she sat in her grandmother's lap and she starts reading the book to her. And I looked at Trisha and I said, have you been reading with her? And she said, well, I've, I mean, I've read her some books, but I haven't taught her how to read. And I said, I looked at Trisha's grandmother, and I, I mean, at Lynn, Trisha's mom, and I said, have you been teaching Allie how to read? Because she kept them a lot. And she said, no. And Allie had just picked up a book and called on and started reading by herself. Well, Nolan was not like that at all. He was very far behind where they were. So we thought, if we put him in a combo class, it'll help him catch up, you know. And I think it did a little bit, but uh, they were telling us at his preschool assessment that 
you know, they take you and they, they take the little counting bears, you know, except I think he had trains, and they say, okay, now put all the blue trains together. Put all the big trains together and the little trains together. Count the trains, you know, and that kind of stuff. And they kind of see where they're at, how high they can count and stuff. Well, when Noah was supposed to count, he came to us and said, I had to count for my teacher today. And I said, well, how high did you count to? He said, 300. And I said, and this is, you know, kindergarten. I said, wow, you counted 300, that's good. He said, yeah, she made me stop. And I said, made you stop? He said, yeah, most of the kids were counting to 10 or 20. A few kids got to 100. He said, I got to 300. And she said, that's enough. And I said, oh, okay. So, you know, we kind of knew right off the bat that math and Noah kind of fit in together. So Nolan, the, our youngest, he's at his pre-K assessment. And they've got scissors there. And we don't let him use scissors. And so... She says, cut this, you know, little teddy bear that's traced out. Well, he can't cut them. I mean, he's switching hands, you know. He looks like he's never used his hands before. He puts them down because he's cramping up, you know. I mean, he's just, he can't cut. And the scissors, you know, those scissors, the scissors with the orange handles, you know. And so she says, all right, look at these little trains. I want you to tell me the colors. And she said, point out blue. And he points at blue. And she says, point out red. And he points at the red. And she says, point at the orange ones. And he said, you don't, you don't have any orange ones. And, of course, there's one there that's supposed to be orange. And she said, well, you don't think these are orange? And you know how sometimes an orange is really like an off red, you know? He said, that's dark red. That's orange. And he points at the scissors, you know. That, and uh, she's like, she, so she brought us over. And she was actually Noah, our 18-year-old. She was Noah's kindergarten teacher, too. And she said, he's really smart. Now, this is the first time we'd heard this about Nolan, okay? And we were like, really? And she tells us the orange story, you know? And I said, well, that, that's observant. I said, but how did he do with the scissors? And she said, uh. And she held up his paper, and it was like this raggy, you know, thing. She said, he didn't do real good with cutting with the scissors. He just knew they were orange, you know. And I said, yeah, we don't let him have sharp objects at our house. So a kindergarten is new and, and different for everybody in their first day of school and all that. And then as you go through the kindergarten year, I know you might have some different memories and stuff. And I, I was trying to remember the things I could remember about my first day in school and my, my first year in school. And you know how silly things stick with you, right? Like you can remember the silliest things. Like although we had Eric in that class that was in his seventh year kindergarten, we also had, you know, they, they don't separate them by brains anymore. Um, I mean, they didn't separate them by brains back then. We had a kid that was repeating kindergarten, and we had a kid named John Hyde who was the smartest person I've ever been around. He could read the, the back of the milk carton in kindergarten. You know, it amazed me. Like, I still remember sitting in the cafeteria, you know, those little cartons that you can't ever open, you know, and you have to try to open them on both ends, and they never tear open just right. And then you finally get it open, and the milk's spoiled because it's cafeteria milk, and it's been sitting in that little cooler that's 74 degrees all day. And I remember showing him the back of my milk carton, and I said, what does this say? And he said, riboflavin. I was like, What? And if you look at the ingredients in milk, it still has riboflavin on the back of it. And I could not believe it. I was telling everybody at lunch, John knows this word. It's riboflavin. John knows this word. I mean, I probably couldn't even pronounce it right back then. But he nailed it, you know. And so I was thinking of little things like that and how silly they are. And I got to think about the cafeteria. You know, they don't really change. But, and I've mentioned this before. Why do they have pizza and corn on the same day every time in the cafeteria. Everybody that's eating in the cafeteria, you know they have pizza and corn on the same day. There is not a pizza restaurant in the world where you can get corn. Right? Those things bother me. I mean, you go to, you, you go to Pizza Hut, you go to Domino's, you go to Papa John's, you go to Sir Pizza, you can't say, oh, and I'd like to have a side order of corn. They don't do it. But every public school in America, when it's pizza day, you've got the corn and the chilled fruit, right? And so those little things, you know, you remember those things and they, they kind of set you back a little bit and you get nostalgic, and although I still never want corn when I eat pizza. But a couple of big, you know, traumatic things will stick with you too. And I remember a couple of major events in kindergarten. Number one, when I was five in October of that year, uh, my younger brother was born. So in kindergarten, my mom was pregnant with my little brother. And I don't remember a lot about being her, her being pregnant, but I do remember, you know, back then, nine months is such a long period, right? It's like my whole lifetime she's pregnant. All I can remember is her being pregnant. And I came in from lunch one day back into the classroom and my teacher said, hey, your parents called and they want you to know that your mom had the baby. And I said, you're lying. 
And I didn't believe her. And she said, no, I'm telling you the truth. And I said, I don't believe you. And she said, no, they're, they're going to come pick you up today and take you to the hospital. You've got a baby brother. And I said, I don't believe you. My mama's still pregnant. Because in my mind, you know, she's supposed to be pregnant. She's been pregnant for a long time. So I remember leaving the school that day and, and, and Noah, I mean, uh, Jason being born. And then I remember negative traumatic things. Uh, I used to hate to use the bathroom at school. And I know that's kind of a common thing, but I was not going to sit on that toilet in kindergarten. I would hold it. I'd pee all day long, but I was not going to sit down on that commode. And one day, coming back from lunch, my stomach was just rolling. And I thought, man, I don't know if I can hold it all day. But I tried. And I failed. And it was the time in class where after lunch, the teacher has her book and she's in a rocking chair and you sit on the carpet in front of her and she reads you the little book, you know. So I'm just sitting there looking and she says, someone's had an accident today. <laughs> and I said, not me. <laughs> and my best friend said, not me either. And so after story time, she calls me up to her desk and she says, Duncan, have you had an accident? And I said, no. And she turns me around, and back then, you know, you could do this. She looks down the back of my pants, and she says, yes, you did. And I said, how did you know it was me? And she said, because you said, not me, just like that. And I said, well, so did the other guy, you know. And she said, yeah, but you said it first. And I remember pooping my pants in kindergarten, right? I probably remember three days in kindergarten, but I remember that day. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So in everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. What do we call that? The golden rule, right? You might be old enough to remember in one of your elementary classes, they would put up on the board or the bulletin, the golden rule. Now in my class, it didn't spell it out. It didn't say do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But we learned in kindergarten that that was, quote unquote, the golden rule. You treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, that got hammered into us. You know, each school has its own little thing, like at Friendship, where Trisha's the assistant principal, they have, their motto is ROAR. Because they're the cougars. And it's respect others. And I don't know what the rest of it is. Does anybody know what the rest of the AR is? Does anybody have some friends? Yeah, okay, we got a friendship student. Tell us what Roar is. Respect, ownership, hey, right there. That's Roar behavior right there. Good job. All right. So they, they learn that from kindergarten on up. Right? Preston, y'all hear it all the time, don't you? I've been at their assemblies where the kids are talking and they're supposed to be quiet. And the teacher goes... Raises her hand and all the students do this. Now where'd they learn that from? They had been taught repetition over and over. When I raise my hand, you do this. And the teacher will say, I need to see roar behavior. And they'll all get real quiet. They'll do like this. Now where did they learn that? They rep it over and over and over. You know, used to, and I'm not old enough to remember this, but I saw a spelling book from Trisha's grandmother's school when it, Hasty was the high school. And when she was in elementary school, they gave them these little books to learn their alphabet and learn how to spell and read and write. And A was for Adam, the first man that God created. That's what the book said. B is for Bible, the Word of God. And that's how they learned their alphabet at Hasty Elementary School back in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. And then they slowly started to remove God from school, and now A is for apple. B is for boy. I remember praying before we ate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I remember that in kindergarten. I had forgotten that, but I remember that we would pray before we'd go to the cafeteria. That's unheard of now in public schools, you know. But how do we learn the golden rule? Even people that aren't Christians, that don't go to church, they were taught what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you have them do. Treat others how you would want to be treated. And we get it repped over and over and over again. All right? Let's look at Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Do y'all remember, did y'all get the report cards that would say... Uh, listens and follows directions and you would get satisfactory or needs improvement and all that kind of stuff um, gets along well with others you know that kind of stuff I always would get satisfactory except for handwriting and and talk excessive talking 
That was one too. Needs improvement. I don't know what that was about, but I would always get a needs improvement on handwriting, which I understood, and, and excessive talking. I always, or refrains from, unnecess- that's what it was. It would say, refrains from unnecessary talking, in. And you'd look down at the bottom and say, needs improvement. So I would always get the ends on my handwriting and talking too much. Let's look at that First Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, when we, when we think about the golden rule and we think about the reps and all that kind of stuff, it makes me wonder, as many times as we've heard the golden rule, how much we actually apply it to our walk. You know, we all say as Christians, oh yeah, golden rule, I treat others the way I want to be treated. But we don't always, do we? I mean, we're pretty good at holding grudges. We're pretty good at being mad and not forgiven. We're pretty good about wanting, you know, I talk all the time about how we always want justice for that person, but we want grace for ourselves, right? We don't want to give the other person the benefit of the doubt. We always assume the worst. Well, she's a witch. That's why she did it. Instead of maybe she was having a bad day. Maybe she just found out her dog's going to die. Maybe she just found out her mom's got cancer. Instead, well, she's a witch. That's why she was rude today. And we jump to the worst possible conclusion for everybody. But when it's us, we're like, I'm sorry, I've had a bad day. Give me a break. And we want grace for us and vengeance and justice for the other person, which is completely opposite of the golden rule. Don't we want somebody to give us the benefit of the doubt? That we had good intentions? That our mind was in the right place? Our heart was in the right place? Or just maybe we went about it the wrong way, right? How many times have you, have I, tried to do something and screwed it up, but our our heart was in the right place. And if that happens to us, we get mad at that other person. We don't say, well, she had good intentions. Well, she was trying to do the right thing. We say, we don't do unto the other person as we'd have it done to us. We don't extend them grace and forgiveness. We want justice. We want vengeance. We want judgment. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Respects authority. The listens and follow direction thing, I used to think I was pretty good at that and I always got satisfactory on this one on the report card. But I remember, and this wasn't kindergarten, this might have been second or third grade, it was after you know you could read pretty good. The teacher gave us this piece of paper and she said, like she would always say, read the instructions and directions first. You know, how many times you heard your teacher say that? And so I did not. And I just started doing the worksheet and going as fast as I could because, you know, if I'm given an assignment, I want to get it done. I want to get it back to the teacher. I want to be done with it. And so I spent an hour doing this worksheet that she gave us, answering all the questions and turning it in. And an hour later, when we were all done, the teacher hands them back out, the ones that actually put names on them because, you know, we don't do a good job putting our names on our papers either. And that's something else the teacher would always say. Put your name on the paper. And she said... All of you that spent an hour doing this, raise your hand. And, you know, all but one kid's hand goes up. And the one kid that didn't raise their hand, she said, will you tell everyone why it did not take you an hour to do this piece of paper? And, you know, it's the smart girl that knows everything. And she said, I didn't do any of it. And that's why it didn't take me an hour. And we're like, oh, she's going to be in trouble. She didn't do any of it. She's going to get a zero. And the teacher said, why did you not do any of it? And she said, well, the first direction was don't do anything on this piece of paper. Don't answer any questions. I was like, oh, snap. I wish I'd have read those instructions. I just spent an hour wasting my time on this, right? And so if we look at the Bible and you look at 1 Thessalonians 2.13 and you keep in mind the golden rule, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as actually the word of God, which is at work, And you who believe. When we read the Word of God, are we really following and listening to the instructions and the directions? See, a lot of times we treat the Bible like that piece of paper that you just want to finish the assignment. Well, I need to read my Bible today. I hadn't read it. Done. Well, you know, I need to go to Bible study. Wednesday night. Okay, I'm here. I'm gone. Well, I need to go to church on Sunday. Check it off. I'm gone. But do we really sit down and look what this says. Received, heard, accepted, Word of God working 
and those that believe. Those are some powerful adjectives and adverbs and verbs, right? Working. Is it really working? Because if you don't read the instructions and the directions, it's not going to work. If you don't know how to build a cake and you just jump into it and start making one, it's not going to end very well, right? You've got to follow the directions. You've got to read the recipe. You've got to go step by step. And we all know if you put two cups of sugar instead of one, it can ruin the cake, right? Or whatever you're making. Or if it says to add a cup of oil and you put a teaspoon, or it says to add a teaspoon and you put a cup, it can screw up the whole recipe, right? I mean, you don't have to be a master chef to know that. Or if it says a teaspoon of salt and you put a cup of salt, so you've got to read the instructions and the directions. If we would take that much time to make sure we got the apple pie right, or the lasagna, why in the world would we not look at this and spend the time, effort, and energy to read the instructions and follow the directions? Because it says, you that have received the word of God, when you heard it, if you accepted it, not just as word of men, because see, this isn't just a bunch of stories written by men. It says it is actually the word of God. Think about that. God has written you, written you and me a letter with instructions and directions for life, and it's all right here. Everything we need to know wasn't in kindergarten. Everything we need to know is right here. And we take those lessons from kindergarten and we carry them into the rest of our lives. We all know how to finger paint, right? Because even a kindergartner can do that. We learn to count. We learn to write. Write our name. Do a little bit of reading. We learned our colors, our alphabet. We learned all those things in kindergarten, in our first year of school. And we apply those things to our life every single day. But then we read the golden rule in the Bible, and we know it's right, but we don't always apply it to everybody. We want it applied to us, but maybe not them, because they're, they're buttholes, okay? And then we read this, and we're like, okay, here's my instructions. I received it. I accepted it. It is the Word of God. Is it working in me? Where's the fruit of it? You know those uh, pieces of paper that we used to get that was colored by numbers? And, you know, when you look at it, just like it's a bunch of lines and numbers. But if you color all the number ones red and all the number twos blue and all the number threes green, pretty soon you've got this beautiful masterpiece. And it's simple, right? I mean, all you've got to be able to do is count one through three and know three or four colors, and you can create this masterpiece. Because the design for the purpose is already there on that piece of paper. See, your life is a beautiful tapestry masterpiece and all of the numbers and the colors to the instructions are right here. And if we apply this to our lives, what look like a bunch of numbers and lines becomes a beautiful masterpiece working in us. All right, let's look at that next slide. So if you got a grade on how things were working for you, what would you get? Is there fruit? Is it working? Would you say that you're actually applying this stuff? Let's look at Colossians chapter 3. If you're in Thessalonians, just back up one book. Colossians chapter 3. And y'all have probably heard this a thousand times. Whatever you do, work at it. I'm sorry, I'm in verse 23. 3, 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as it's working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. See, if we apply this, it's not for our glory. It's for God's glory. If we will read these instructions and follow it, then we start to carry out what God intended for us and it'll start to affect other people. Now, you may think to yourself, I'm getting a bad grade. You know, if the truth be told, needs improvement. My grade would be needs improvement. Am I giving other people the benefit of the doubt? Am I treating everybody else with the golden rule? Am I accepting, hearing, and receiving the word of God and living it out? Satisfactory, very good, needs improvement. Only you and God know the true answer to that, right? I could need, look, we all need improvement, but I could be up here completely faking it, and you wouldn't know. I mean, you might would figure it out eventually, 
nobody really knows your heart except for you and God. And sometimes we're not honest with ourselves. Sometimes we lie to ourselves about the condition of our heart, about the condition of our spirituality. But it doesn't matter if we lie to ourselves or not. God knows the truth. We can't fool Him. So if God was giving you a grade, would it be a very good, a satisfactory, or needs improvement? And again, we all need improvement. We can all do better. But are we bearing any of these fruits? Now, here's some encouragement if you are in the needs improvement branch, okay? You are going to fail at times. There are going to be classes that you excel in and classes that you don't. I remember when Trisha was at UNCG, now she was a straight-A student her whole life. She got to UNCG, and she struggled. She still made A's, but she struggled because she's a note-taker. And she would come back from class with 50 pages of notes. And she would be studying for a test at the end of the week and going through all these notes. And I'm like, Trisha, why are you writing all that down? And she said, well, that's what I did in school, in high school. And I said, why don't you just listen to them? Instead of, you can't hear what they're saying if you're just writing every word. And she said, well, I can't listen and comprehend. I have to write it down and read it and study it. So that wasn't working in college. And when she, she got in a really tough class, you know, a lot of times in college, it's kind of who the professor is. Like you can take the same class with two different professors and this professor, you're going to get an A because of the way they teach. And the other professor, you're going to fail because of the way they don't teach, right? Well, she had one of those that you're going to fail because they don't teach. And she went home that weekend and she told her dad, she said, Dad, I need to drop this class because I'm going to fail it. Well, that was not the right thing to say. And her dad said, you will not drop this class. You're going to finish in four years and you need this class to do it. You will pass this class. And she said, Dad, I'm failing this class. If I don't drop it, I'm going to fail it. I can't pass this class. And he said, you will pass this class. And so she didn't drop it, and she stayed in that class, and she failed it. And then she retook it the next semester with a different professor and made an A in it. Same subject, same junk, but she got the A with a different professor. You're going to have classes, times in your life, seasons, sections, that you fail. But you're going to have some that you succeed in, too. But if you're failing and things are going bad... Here's some encouragement for you. You've probably heard me tell this story before. We all have memories of the first day of school or the first day of kindergarten. Uh, I can tell this story now because Allie's out in the trailer. But this year was our trifecta year. We had one start in kindergarten, one start in freshman year in high school, and one start in his senior year. You know, for years we talked about, you know, when Trisha was first pregnant with Nolan, we were like, Wow, in six years, we're going to have a kindergartner and a freshman and a senior. And then, you know, at Nolan's second birthday party, we're like, you know, in a few years, we're going to have a freshman and a sophomore and a senior. And then it got here. And it's that morning, and Nolan's going off to school to be a kindergartner, and Noah's going to be a senior, and Allie's going to be a freshman. And, you know, Allie had picked out her first day outfit to go back to school in, months in advance you girls in the back y'all know how it is right you buy your back to school outfit in june you stand in front of the mirror 60 times right <laughs> trying it on seeing how you look in it and then the first day of school comes and Allie is ready to go at 7 30 and she's standing at the door going come on noah looking upstairs to noah going we're going to be late let's go let's go well noah had strength class first period and he had for like three years in a row and they get to wear t-shirts and shorts and they get an opportunity to change. So the bell rings at 8. They give them 10 minutes to change clothes at strength class. And then they take roll. So Noah knows, and he's driving himself to school. I don't have to be there till 10 after 8 because I'm already wearing my T-shirt and shorts. I'll just go strolling into class at 8, 10. I'll be counted present during the roll, and I'm good to go. Well, Allie is the one that has to get there early. You know, she wants to be there early. It's the first day of school, freshman year. She's nervous. And so she's like, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. And she's wearing her perfect outfit that she bought in June. And Noah's like, we got plenty of time, Allie. It takes five minutes to get there. And so she's downstairs with her backpack on, 
new outfit, looks beautiful with all the makeup that spent 20 hours to get ready. And she looks upstairs at the balcony where Noah's coming out of the bathroom. She says, Noah, we've got to go. And he throws the car keys down at her. And he says, go get in the car. I'll be there in a minute. And she bends over to pick up the keys and her pants go. (laughs) And when they went, I don't mean they went. I mean they went. It's those tight genie pants, you know, not the stretchy pants, but tight jeans, you know. And they were white. And they ripped from the, the crotch, the top of the crotch, all the way down the inseam to her knee. I mean, a big gaping hole. She immediately starts crying. And I don't mean, I mean, she was like, ah, ah, what am I going to do? And I'm, I'm in shock. You know, all this is registering with me first day of school, freshman year. Oh my gosh, tra- it's traumatic. Her pants just ripped. And she looks at me and she says, what am I going to do? And I said, You've got 60 pairs of pants upstairs. Go put on another pair of pants. And she looks down at her pants. When she bends down, you know, they gape open. And she says, I'm just going to wear these. And she goes to go outside. And when she turns, I can see her panties. And I said, I can see your underwear. You can't go out looking like that. you got to go change. And so she runs up the steps. And she's gone for like two or three minutes. And then she comes back down. And she's still wearing them. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm just going to wear these. It'll be fine. I said, Allie, your panties are showing. I can see your entire leg. You've got to go back upstairs. They won't let you wear that. I'm not going to let you wear that. And so she goes back upstairs. She changes pants. She comes back down. She's still crying. Noah said, driving to school, he had to look out the window because he was laughing so hard. And he said, yeah, I had to drive like this because you know, I didn't want to laugh. And, and Allie was telling me later, she said, all the way to school, Noah was looking out the window. And I said, well, I think I know why. Now, she's going to remember that for the rest of her life, right? Epic fail. First day back to school. Maddie, had y'all heard that story before? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I told somebody that story. It was one of her friends. She said, I have never heard that before. She's never told me that. And I said, well, you need to ask her if you can borrow those white pants, because I'm sure we got them somewhere. But, you know, she's going to remember that epic fail for the rest of her life. And we all have some epic fails that we're going to remember the rest of our life, right? But the Bible tells us that those that have received Christ, all of those epic fails are wiped away. All those failures, all those sins are wiped away. I don't know what your grade is. I don't know what you're getting from God. I don't know if He would give you a very good, a satisfactory, or needs improvement. But what I do know is He can forgive whatever epic fails are in your life. They're going to come up, they're going to play a last song, And before you leave today, you can get a good grade from God. You can get the very good, well done, good and faithful servant grade. And you can start on that right now. So wherever you are in your walk, if you're, hey, I live by the golden rule. I do know it's the word of God. I apply it to my life. And you can see the fruit of that. If that's you, great. If you're a Christian and that's not you, well, I haven't done real good with that. I haven't done good with that. Well, let's get good with that. And if you're not a Christian, you're like, you know what? I'm not saved. I've never asked Christ to come into my life. So I don't know where I'd plug in any of that. Well, today you can fix that. Today you can plug in and you can get Him in your life. There's no reason to go out there with a needs improvement sign on you. When you can make it right with Christ today. Let's pray. Lord, if there's a Christian in here right now and maybe they haven't been given other Christians and other people the golden rule benefit of the doubt maybe they haven't been treating others like they would be wanted to be treated maybe they haven't obeyed your word and applied it to their life and maybe it's not working in their lives because they're not applying it and so if there's a Christian in here right now Lord that's been struggling and needs improvement that they would just reach out to you right now and say Lord I want to rededicate my walk to you I want you to say well done good and faithful servant I want a very good not just a satisfactory and definitely not a needs improvement. I want to please you, Lord. So pour your Holy Spirit upon me. Draw me closer to you. Be a light and a lamp to my path and to my walk, Lord. And if there's somebody in here, Lord, that's not a Christian, and they're not sure where they would end up tomorrow if they died tonight, that they would just cry out to you right now and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I don't know where I'd be if I died. And so the best way I know how, I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Forgive me for my sins. Lord, as they play this last song, just fill this place with your holy presence. Let everyone in here know that the altar is open and that your throne is open. 
that your mercy seat is available for all those that seek mercy. We ask all these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Duncan Davis at Impact Church. Thank you for listening today. We hope and pray that today's message has impacted your life for Christ. We pray that you'll impact others' lives for Christ. Come and fellowship with us at Impact Church on Sunday mornings at 1030. Have a great day and God bless you.